Next Wednesday, we're having David Swenson uh, lecture to us, uh, and he heads up the Yale Endowment or the investment of the Yale Endowment. Uh, and uh, I have a, a New York Times article on the syllabus, uh, just a, sort of a biography of him that you could read. Uh, on reserve, I have his uh, uh, his recent books. Uh, so I, I hope that you will uh, get a lot from him. Uh, he uh, I, I misspoke. He's, he's not a Yale College graduate. He's a Yale Economics PhD. His undergraduate was from University of Wisconsin, um, but he's been at Yale a very long time. He came uh, to Yale from Wall Street in 1985, uh, and at that time the Yale endowment was worth about one billion dollars. Uh, it, it is now under his leadership, 22.5 billion, uh, and that that uh, that that ex explains a lot <laughs> of the quality of your life, <laughs> um, because that means we have about two million dollars per student, uh, and the interest on two million dollars is uh, what is that? Uh, hundred? I can't even do division. About hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, and so that's why uh, Yale is more, much more generous with uh, financial aid than other universities, and why we have beautiful. Of course, this room was built, I believe, in the 30s. <laughs> but uh, uh, don't thank David Swenson for this room, but uh, for a lot of other things. Um, so uh, Yale uh, had a 28 percent return on its portfolio last year, which was number one of all college endowments. Uh, moreover, it had a 17.8 percent. Average return for the last ten years, which is number one among uh, university endowments, um, we beat Harvard. <laughs> we beat Princeton, <laughs> but actually, uh, Princeton wa was the head of the Princeton uh, endowment is uh, a protege of David Swenson, uh, and I'm sure that these people get together and talk. All of the major universities, Harvard has been doing very well too, and so has uh, Duke, MIT, Amherst. A lot of uh, it seems that universities uh, manage to invest very well. Uh, at least they have in recent decades, and I think that has my theory. That has something to do with the intellectual atmosphere at universities. That uh, investing well requires uh, careful study, and the intellectual tradition we have at universities uh, helps uh, promote that. So. Uh, I don't know if David Swenson can continue to do this. <laughs> I think we're, uh, he's had a, a spectacular return, but he's getting into a challenging year. This is a year of financial crises, so I'm warning you ahead that don't expect a 28 percent return on the Yale portfolio uh, for the coming year. Um, you can ask him about that. <laughs> I don't know if he can do it again in this cri in this situation. It will be amazing. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so that, that would be next Wednesday. So um, meanwhile, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, talk today about regulation, uh, and uh, wow, I think we're all right. <laughs> um, yeah, something needs more regulation here, I think. So uh, have all these wires. So. Uh, I wanted to, to motivate regulation in terms of the last lecture. That, uh, th our previous lecture was about behavioral finance, and it was about human failings. Uh, and I think that uh, we motivate a lot of our regulation of financial markets by the kinds of errors that people make. And I wanted to list a few, uh, uh, a few errors that are well known, uh, and that. Uh, are exploited by unscrupulous people in finance, uh, and so I think they motivate uh, a lot of what uh, regular. So I'm going to write a number of principles of behavioral finance down and just mention them briefly, and then we'll turn to regulation. So uh, these are things from the field of psychology. Wishful thinking. This refers to the fact that people. Uh, this sounds like something you probably already know, but it's been documented by psychologists. People tend 
to make the error of believing what they want to believe. All right. Uh, so, for example, uh, people tend to believe that their team will win. This has been documented by psychologists. They have a bias. If you ask them, what's the probability that Yale will win the Yale-Harvard game? Uh, don't expect Yale students or Harvard students to give a bi unbiased probability. You tend to, in your mind, think that you're going to win. Uh, and this also applies to elections. We just had a, a, a primary uh, uh, yesterday. People tend to assume that the candidate that they believe in will win. So it's well known. And this is something that can be exploited uh, by uh, people selling investments. Uh, second thing, attention anomalies. Um, uh, these are uh, human attention tends to be sporadic. Uh, that is, that you the errors that people naturally make are often errors of inattention. You look at certain things and you overly uh, you pay too much attention to some things and too little to others. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is something that psychologists have been talking about for over a hundred years. Uh, human attention is part of human intelligence. We have to know what to pay attention to, and people of who are not good in focusing their attention on the right things. I'm not talking just about attention deficit disorder. I'm talking about some more high level uh, question of how you know what you should be paying attention to. Uh, and uh, under attention, there's a social basis for attention. And that is that people uh, tend to pay attention to what other people are paying attention to. And so, uh, uh, it's easy to sweep things under the rug and get people to forget something. Uh, the kinds of things that are naturally talked about get excessive attention, and the details tend to get forgotten. Uh, three is anchoring. This refers to a, a, a tendency for people in making quantitative judgments to subconsciously have their judgments anchored uh, by uh, some arbitrary stimulus. Uh, and I mentioned overconfidence last period. We then tend to have overconfidence in our anchored judgments. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the uh, classic experiment that demonstrated anchoring was Kahneman and Tversky. I'm writing K and T uh, in a Wheel of Fortune experiment. Which they did in 1974. Uh, what they did is they uh, they they got subjects to participate in a psychological experiment, and the experiment consisted of asking the subjects questions that had quantitative answers, which were always numbers from zero to a hundred. Uh, and then they said, "I'm going to ask you a question, but before you answer the question, I'm going to spin." A wheel of fortune. You know, you know the wheel of. It's like one of those things on quiz shows. It, 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 you spin this big wheel and it rotates for a while, and then it stops at one number. But obviously, a random number because this wheel of fortune had all the numbers from zero to a hundred. Okay. So one of the questions they asked was, "What percent of African nations belong to the United Nations?" Okay. And uh, that apparently is a difficult question <laughs> that most people didn't know in 1974. Uh, but they, when they did it, they said, "We'll ask you the question and think." But while you're thinking about it, don't answer yet. We're going to spin this wheel of fortune, and so it comes up with a random number. Okay. Then they ask for the answer. Well, it turns out that people tended to give an answer close to the number that came up on the wheel of fortune. All right. Now they perfectly well knew that the real wheel of fortune was random. Uh, so uh, the experimenters, after they got the number, they'd say. Hey, your number is almost the same as the number that just came up, uh, and people would. And he said, "Did you just give me the number that came up?" And people would deny it. They would say, "Oh no, I wasn't influenced by that number." The, the point of anchoring is that you are subconsciously influenced by numbers, uh, and that it affects your judgment. You think you know, 
So, for example, in looking at a stock price, if you ask people to predict a stock market price, they think of some number that they saw before, uh, and they are overly influenced by that number. So, for example, if you in uh, the late 1990s, you were to ask uh, a question, I'm, I'm hy hypothesizing, uh, how likely is it that, that the Dow will be over 10,000 by, by the year 2008? Uh, people might give that a low probability because it had never been over 10,000, and so they just had no psychological anchoring on that number. Um, so, uh, but once it passes 2,000, then it seems completely natural, uh, and that's anchoring. Related to this is uh, the uh, representativeness heuristic. I can't even write this. It's a long word. Representativeness heuristic. It seems to me that uh, if you type this, you'll get a spell check error. Uh, and that's Kahneman and Tversky again. Uh, and it's related to anchoring in some sense. What it means is that uh, it refers to a human tendency <coughs> to judge events on the basis of similarity to other events that are prominent in our, in our mind without regard to the actual probability of the event. Uh, I'll give you an, uh, one of Kahneman and Tversky's examples. People were asked uh, to uh, judge the occupation of a young woman, and they had a description of the young woman, and the woman was described as sensitive, artistic, etc. Uh, and uh, then the, the occupation choices that they were allowed were bank teller, sculptress, or something else. <laughs> All right. Uh, many people chose sculptress because they thought, well, if she's a sensitive, artistic woman, maybe she's a sculptress. Uh, but that is a, uh, uh, a terrible mistake because in we should know that sculptresses are very rare. Very few people have the job of a sculptress or sculptor. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, it's a mistake. So that what it means is that people will. Gosh, <laughs> I'm being caught here. <laughs> what it means is that I have to stuff this wire in my pocket. Uh, what it means is that uh, we sometimes exaggerate in our imagination some rare event, and it colors our thinking. Uh, so, for example, the um, stock market crash of 1929 is repeatedly. Re-expected, even though it only happened once, but it's just uh, prominent in our thinking. And people are looking at stock prices to see patterns that they remember, that are prominent in their thinking, and then those patterns uh, are given an exaggerated probability. Uh, so when we looked at the random walk series, I think the representativeness heuristic played a role in there as well. When you when you look at a random walk, you have the intuitive impression. That you can extrapolate it, that it doesn't look like you can't believe it's really random. Uh, but the reason you can't is because you overweight the probability of certain uh, things that caught your attention. Um, okay, so um, there's some more. I'm gonna uh, So, um, five is gambling behavior. <coughs> Anthropologists have found that uh, gambling is present in all human cultures. Not that everyone gambles, but uh, there will be, you, you go to any uh, human society and ask about it, and there will be some game of chance. That they play that uh, uh, that influences their thinking. So uh, the uh, the problem with uh, uh, there, there's a problem with gambling behavior because in a certain fraction of the population we have pathological gambling. Uh, one study estimated that 1.1 percent of men and a half a percent of women, for some reason more common among men than women, but in both sexes, are pathological gamblers. That means uh, it's like alcoholism. They cannot control themselves, and it ruins their lives. 
they get divorces because the spouse complains that, you know, my, my husband or wife gambled away the, all of our money and bad, but they can't stop themselves. There's an organization called Gamblers Anonymous, uh, which helps. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous. It helps people who are really in trouble. Uh, and this is a problem. Now, I think the financial industry attracts people <laughs> like that, and so you're overrepresented. If people who are not quite pathological, uh, people who are stimulated somehow by chance, uh, uh, and uh, that's, that is a, um, uh, a problem. Uh, magical thinking. Uh, this refers. This actually goes back to B. F. Skinner, a psychologist. Uh, who uh, flourished in the first half of this century. I actually had him as a next-door neighbor once. <laughs> it's a strange thing. I was visiting uh, in uh, Harvard and MIT at, uh, in uh, Cambridge, and I, I rented a house, and this guy was next door. And he and I both used to walk into work together. <laughs> Not together. <laughs> I never really met him. <laughs> but I always felt an affinity with him. Now, he must have died uh, 20 years ago by now. But anyway, he did a famous experiment uh, with pigeons, uh, which uh, in the 1940s uh, and uh, 1948, uh, in which he induced strange behavior patterns in pigeons by the following simple experiment. Uh, the experiment was the, he would um, put the pigeon was in a cage, okay, and he'd let the pigeon get pretty hungry, okay, <laughs> and hungry pigeons are not happy pigeons. And then he had a machine that granted each pigeon one piece of corn every 15 seconds. Okay, uh, and so that's very frustratingly slow for a hungry pigeon <laughs> to get it a piece, one piece every 15 seconds. Uh, and then he observed through time, uh, after subjecting pigeons to this torture for some time, it might be not approved by. <laughs> it's not really torture. Right? It's like dieting or something. You all live through that, right? But. Uh, semi-torture for a pigeon. He noticed that the pigeons started behaving in strange ways, so, uh, and he kept them separate so they couldn't learn from each other. Uh, one pigeon was jumping up and down a lot, and another one was bobbing its head, and another one was doing a kind of a little dance. And uh, what he concluded was these pigeons were trying to figure out what makes those pieces of corn come, and they started to think, well, he, he had to get the interval between corns right to make this work. But he started to, the pigeon started to think effectively that, what, what was it I did just before that last piece of corn came? And I, I was bobbing my head, so maybe I'd better bob my head again. And sure enough, another piece of corn comes. And so they start assuming that what they were doing uh, is making the corn come. Uh, and so, but each one does a different thing. So if they're all in isolation, they would all be doing different things. But I think our financial markets are like that, that people, they develop some investment strategy and through pure chance it does well. But they, because of overconfidence and uh, magical thinking, it starts to go to their ego. They think, I'm really a smart investor. I've figured it out. Uh, and uh, it can reinforce the behavior uh, uh, until they get to maybe some terrible end. And that doesn't necessarily work out as well. B.F. Skinner never let his pigeons starve. And they all made it out all right. Uh, there's something else called quasi magical thinking, uh, which was uh, a term coined many years later by uh, Eldar Shafir uh, and Amos Tversky. Uh, Shafir is a young uh, psychologist at uh, Princeton. Who teamed up with the old psychologist Tversky uh, and wrote uh, this paper? Um, uh, and what it refers to is it's uh, uh, people uh, get the impression that they can control randomness. Uh, maybe the pigeons were thinking that, maybe not, we don't know. Uh, Shafir and Tversky report experiments with people, not pigeons. Okay, and quasi-magical thinking is a, a an, al an illusion that they documented occurs regularly in people. Uh, 
which they might deny if asked about, but there's an illusion that I can control randomness through my willpower or my. Uh, I won't talk about their experiments, but I just want to mention one um, by a Harvard psychologist, Ellen Langer. I mentioned this before, but I'll, I, I think I've mentioned it before. Uh, if you say, I'm, I'm going to ask you to bet on a coin toss, uh, and I, and it w there's two different ways of doing it. One is to say, uh, how, much do you, how much will you bet? And then I toss the coin. But the other way is I toss the coin first and I conceal uh, the outcome. And then I ask, how much would you like to bet? And Langer found that people want to bet more if the coin hasn't been tossed yet. Okay. Why would that be? Why would you care? It's still the same experiment. It appears that people, at some level, think that they, they can exert willpower over it and control it. Uh, and this gives rise, again, to overconfidence among investors. It's also another example, which is relevant. Uh, I don't know if any of you voted yesterday. Um, why do people vote? Because uh, economic theory would say that nobody ever votes. If we're all, it, it, conventional economic theory says we're all relentlessly selfish and calculating, right? Isn't that what you've learned in economics? And so, <laughs> uh, well, maybe you didn't necessarily, but that is a, a canonical theory. But if you're relentlessly selfish and calculating, you would say, I'm, the chances that I decide the election are zero, right? And so I just, uh, I, I'm just not going to bother. The question is, you must have thought that, right? You know that you're not going to decide the election, uh, and so what does it matter? And so, if you can introspect and ask, why is it that I vote? Uh, I think that at least for many of us, there is a there is a sort of logical conundrum we go through, and that is, uh, if good people don't vote, then we'll be in a bad world, okay? And so, I have to vote to prove that good people vote, and then maybe it will happen. If I'm a good person, then other people will be good person, right? This is magical thinking. Uh, and it, uh, it affects people because it gives them a sense of confidence and power uh, over events that are thought to be random or uncontrollable. Uh, so uh, it can also uh, be something that uh, can be exploited by, uh, by uh, some uh, not so nice people. Okay. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, regulation then. The problem with finance is that uh, it's a beautiful, financial institutions are beautiful structures, uh, but they only uh, are as good as the people who use them. And so uh, the problem is that the history of finance is the history of a lot of people, uh, a lot of people being. Uh, exploited and treated badly. So uh, there's uh, temptations of the market that uh, people who uh, know human psychology know that they can exploit human weaknesses. Uh, and so there's a temptation to oversell uh, investments, that is, promise that they will do well. Uh, you see this all the time. I was just seeing yesterday's paper. Someone was selling gold coins. <laughs> One of the, you know, don't buy gold coins that you might <laughs> see. You know that, right? But there were words in there. They said something. Of course, we cannot guarantee that they won't go up in value, but, uh, but historically they have always done it or something like that. They're trying to oversell. You know that buying gold coins from some newspaper ad is not a smart investment, uh, but, but they know that there will be people out there. Uh, you know, a recent example of overselling, the National Association of Realtors has been running ads saying that home prices have always doubled every 10 years. Uh, they, they didn't do it, they didn't word that, they put it in the present tense. Home prices double every 10 years. Uh, so th that's an organization of people who sell real estate, and they have ad campaigns trying to convince you that home prices are going to double. Uh, that's overselling because we're in a real estate crisis and home prices are falling, um, and uh, that's the kind of thing that makes some people upset. Uh, there's a tendency to hide information. Uh, you 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 avoid telling people the things that would discourage them. People have attention anomalies, so they don't 
go out and see all the information. And you, you, if, if you don't put it up front, you, uh, then they'll never find it. Uh, there's a tendency for loyalty to friends. That's your own friends. Uh, and there's this word, other people. I think different languages have different. Uh, you know, there's, there's friends, and then there's all those random people that we don't care about. Uh, and so uh, investors will have a tendency to try to hide from, uh, or people who sell investments will try to channel the uh, good investments to their friends and take it uh, and, and dump the bad stuff on other people. That's what's been happening a little bit, more than a little bit, in the subprime crisis. So we've managed to package subprime loans that we thought, some people thought were terrible, and sell them off to uh, unwitting foreigners uh, who <laughs> didn't know. They thought that they were getting good stuff. Uh, there's also a tendency for churning for commissions. Uh, this is a, a, a fault that real estate brokers can make. Uh, if they're paid by commission on each trade, they just keep calling you up and coming up with new ideas for new trades. Uh, and so uh, that's unethical behavior uh, because it uh, uh, because if you if you keep trading too much, then you c you cannot possibly make money. The, the trading commissions will eat up all of your profits, and professionals know that. So it's it's bad behavior. So we have uh, historically developed. Uh, regulation, regulations that deal with, um, with these problems. The only reason, reason I believe that we have financial markets that work is because we have the regulations. So I'm going to talk primarily about U.S. regulations uh, and uh, give a little history of it. But the U.S. is actually an important country for regulation because uh, it has been a model for much of the regulations around the world. So uh, I, I'm going to give a kind of a history of, of financial regulations in the United States. Uh, that it makes it r rather uh, a simple story, and the simple story is that regulation uh, mostly came in with the Progressive Era uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, and reached its culmination at the time of the Great Depression, uh, and set up a lot of institutions that. Are still with us today, and then there was deregulation, which started in around the 1970s, uh, and the events we've seen well, that we're seeing today is an outcome of both the regulation and the deregulation. So uh, I wanted to start out with uh, the origins of securities regulation. Uh, a critical point was uh, a book written by Louis Brandeis. Uh, that's the guy that Brandeis University is named after. Uh, he was an author, a lawyer, then Supreme Court Justice. Uh, but he wrote a book in 1914 uh, called Other People's Money. And uh, it was very influential. I, I have it on reserve, but that's not required for the midterm. It's just if you're interested to see it. Uh, and um, uh, he believed that uh, uh, the, the most important step uh, for the government in promoting better financial markets is disclosure, to force, uh, to force businesses or financial uh, businesses to disclose the truth equally to everybody. Uh, and uh, his famous quote is, Sunshine is the best disinfectant. Sunshine meaning the truth, and uh, everyone in the financial industry has to just tell people what they're doing. Uh, and he said it, it has to be really disclosed. And he likened it to uh, labeling. They were, they were already, uh, in 1914, starting to require that uh, food packages would show nutritional or ingredients and nutritional information. Uh, I was on the package. <laughs> And he thought that's the kind of model for the financial industry. The disclosure has to be made convenient, so that it's not like you can get the information by going downtown to City Hall and asking for it. So the, the principle is that you have to require that the information be given uh, to the investor. 
So that was a very important. Um, so in uh, around the time of this book, state regulators were um, developing uh, at the state government level in the United States uh, what they call blue sky laws. These were laws uh, regulating how securities are sold, uh, and the, I, uh, there's different theories about why they call them blue sky laws. But I think it was because people were overselling investments and saying there's no limit to this investment but the blue sky above. Uh, so uh, the problem with the blue sky laws is that they were each state done separately, and it was hard for states to manage what were basically. Um, National businesses. So the blue sky laws were basically coming in in the teens. In the 1920s, things changed because the telephone first became wide, widely spread. Uh, until the, until around that until the teens, telephones were very expensive because they didn't have uh, good amplification technology. But by the 20s, everybody got a telephone in their house. Um, and the average person made hundreds of phone calls a year, so it was a big change in our society. And this led to the uh, boiler rooms. I don't know if you know that uh, the so-called boiler these were businesses that called around on the telephone and sold stocks, often bogus stocks, um, in the 1920s. The, the reason they called them boiler rooms is uh, if you are um, selling stocks by telephone, there's no reason to rent a nice office, right? So you, you get the cheapest. So you, you put a whole bank of telephones in the cheapest place, and that would be the basement of some building where they have the boiler, <laughs> and so you'd have a whole bunch of people selling securities down there, and they could vacate quickly if the authorities <laughs> challenged you. Uh, so um, uh, in the 1920s, a lot of bogus stuff was sold. A lot of people were cheated, uh, and so after the stock market crash of 1929, it led to a movement for regulation. Uh, and so, uh, the, the most important uh, thing was the 1934 foundation of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Or SEC, uh, which I think ultimately um, Dates back to it's really the embodiment of Louis Brandeis' principles. So uh, this uh, Securities and Exchange Commission was uh, a, an organization that I, I guess you say it's, its principal structure. Its principal thing was to make sure that disclosure was proper and that people uh, were found it easy to get the uh, information about securities. Uh, and the SEC uh, was very controversial at first because it was seen as interfering with business. And the U.S. has been built on principles of, of individual freedom, and this seemed like unnecessary government intrusion. Uh, so there was a hostile attitude between business and the original SEC. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was viewed as very left wing by business and very. Uh, 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 contrary to American values, but in fact, the SEC promoted the very free market uh, concepts that were uh, that were widely believed in in this country. Uh, basically, what it did is it made it feel that people won't get cheated, uh, and so uh, the SEC was a strong regulator, uh, and it. Uh, uh, it really did restore confidence in the financial markets in this country. Other countries in Europe, after the 1929 crash, they had a different reaction to the uh, scandals and problems of the 20s, and it wasn't as favorable to markets as in the U.S. But the Securities and Exchange Commission, from the beginning, had it as its mission to make uh, financial markets work properly, uh, and that is uh, a, a wonderful story. So. Uh, one of the first uh, chairmen of the SEC uh, was <coughs> a man named William O. Douglas, uh, who uh, 
was actually a Yale Law professor. Uh, I guess he influences me uh, because um, I, I, have on, I have on the reading list, again, it's an optional reading, uh, but uh, he has a book uh, called Democracy and Finance. Nineteen forty, uh, and uh, what he advocated again is that financial markets have to be made to work for uh, the people. Uh, I guess this influenced me. Uh, actually, in my two thousand and three book, New Financial Order, I talked about the democratization of finance as a fundamental principle. We have to make finance work for real people, and so for me that meant understanding human frailties and. Uh, un understanding human psychology to make things work. Uh, he was also uh, a major figure in the legal realism um, uh, school, which was uh, that represented re recognized uh, human uh, failings and human uh, behavior in establishment of the laws. We have to realize that people don't read all the fine print uh, and don't understand. If you have a precisely wit written contract in legal language, maybe they don't get it. Uh, one of the things that came out uh, and was firmly embodied into law with the advent of the SEC, there were pre pre precursors to this, but the SEC enforces the difference between public and private securities. This is a very important distinction. Uh, public securities are securities that the SEC doc, uh, uh, um, will uh, accept as suitable for the general public, and private securities are securities that have not been vetted by the SEC for the general public. So. Uh, uh, the SEC. Uh, you have to decide. You, you'll hear about public companies and private companies. If you're a public company, it means that you've gone through the procedures at the SEC to be approved as a public company. If you are a public company, the, the, the important thing is you have to do all of the disclosure that uh, Lewis Brandeis would have liked. So you have to fo file regular forms with the SEC disclosing information. Uh, public companies. And these uh, public companies, if you want to get on the SEC website, uh, go to sec.gov, and then there's a, uh, there is a, uh, <coughs> a uh, tab that you can click, which is Edgar. Uh, and uh, if you click on Edgar, you can enter the name of any public company in the United States. Uh, and then all of its filings are online. And you can find out incredible amount of information about companies. Uh, it's all there as long as they're public companies. Uh, so public, a lot of companies don't want to be public <laughs> because you can't keep secrets very well. You've got to regularly put those things up online, and they're out there for everybody to see. Um, so why do as, uh, companies can choose whether to be public or private? Why do they choose to be public? Well, they, it's a balancing. They have to balance. Sometimes they don't like the choice they made, but uh, the, the advantage to being public is that people trust you more. Uh, moreover, your market is bigger, uh, and, and uh, so public companies have an advantage. So uh, companies don't like to be public generally. It's contrary to their instincts. We we keep all sorts of secrets in our company. We don't want to be filing all of our information all the time. And having it go right up on the website on standard forms, <laughs> so that everyone can easily process it. Uh, but they they may swallow their doubts because they have a sense that it will improve the market for their shares. And so we have uh, a, a lot of public companies. Um, now, if you are a public uh, private company, uh, you are limited to uh, what. Uh, uh, where you can sell your investments. Uh, and let's talk an example of, of an important kind of private company. It's called a hedge fund. Okay.
if you are, if this is not, this is a private investment company. Uh, let's, let's think for, before we talk about hedge. Think of suppose you're a public investment company uh, approved by the SEC. The problem with being a public investment company is you have to file quarterly reports about all the things you've invested in. I mean, and so you say, how can I make money beating the market if every quarter I have to tell everybody what I'm doing? Uh, and so uh, a lot of investment companies don't want to be public. They want to be private, so they don't have to hedge funds. Do not post their investments on Edgar, and so uh, they're private. Um, but if you're a private company, you're subject to regulation that limits uh, a lot of things you can do. Notably, you're not allowed to advertise. Uh, if you're a hedge fund, you're not for the public. You're not approved for investing by the public. So what business do you have to put buy ads in newspapers announcing yourself? Uh, as a result, hedge funds. Uh, are, have a very low profile. It's not their choice. They might like to advertise, but they can't without running afoul of the SEC. They'll say, you're behaving like a public company, and you're not public. Uh, and so hedge funds um, do not advertise. So that's why people don't know about them, and they, they have a mysterious, uh, uh, they, they sound mysterious. Um, but moreover, very significantly, uh, they're uh, they are limited in what kind of investors they can take. Uh, now, there's different kinds of hedge funds. Th there's a lot of legal complexity here, but uh, a 3C1 hedge fund uh, is limited to 99 investors. Uh, and that's not very many people. Uh, and they must be accredited investors. And so you ask, what is an accredited investor? Well, if you want to find out, you can get onto sec.gov, and it will give you the current definition. So I wonder how many of you are accredited investors. I would guess not many of you. Uh, here's how you become an accredited investor: A, you have one million dollars in investable. A that's not including your house. It's in investable assets. Okay. Uh, I won't ask for a show of <laughs> I don't know how many. <laughs> Two, you're making at least two hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, or um, you, uh, if you're married, you have to be the couple making at least three hundred thousand. Um, so, um, it's supposed to be a fund for rich people. It's done. They haven't raised the definitions of accredited investors for many years. So uh, last year, the SEC uh, put out a proposal. That uh, you know, it's getting too easy to be a, an accredited investor, uh, and so they r put out a proposal that we raise the uh, wealth level to 2.5 million. Okay, uh, and I thought they were going to, and that was to protect people who might be naive, innocent people who only have a million dollars or only have two million dollars and don't know what they're doing uh, from hedge funds. But uh, it got shot down apparently because it never, never happened. I, I think it's very hard to raise the definition of accredited investors, because the minute you do that, you're closing large numbers of people out from their ability to invest in hedge funds, and they don't like that. They feel insulted, so uh, there's a lot of angry reaction. Uh, there's also another kind of hedge fund, 3C7, uh, which can take 500 investors uh, if they if they register as a 3C7, they can take more investors, but then they're li limited to qualified purchasers. <laughs> and this is just an example of their regulations. Uh, and a qualified purchaser uh, has to have at least $5 million, uh, or if it's an institution, at least $25 million. Uh, that is a natural person. Uh, a natural person refers to a human being. Uh, so it's five million for natural persons uh, and 25 million for institutions. So if you're a small college with only 20 million in a portfolio, you don't come across as a um, qualified purchaser. They're trying to protect innocent small colleges who only have 20 million dollars. The idea is that people who don't have much money can't afford expensive lawyers and 
they can't figure it out, and they really shouldn't be investing in hedge funds. Uh, so that is the uh, uh, these these are public-private uh, uh, distinctions are onerous or, or offensive to some people because it it's, it seems like the government is uh, acting like a parent, and most of the people are. If you're not accredited as an investor, it's like the government doesn't respect you, uh, right? I mean, it's like they're treating you like children. Why would it be that somebody else is allowed to invest in a hedge fund and I'm not? Uh, so uh, it rankles. But on the other hand, these regulations survive because the reality is that people are victimized all the time, and uh, uh, we can't uh, just allow. Uh, companies to act in secrecy. Uh, this is something that I believe in. Not everyone believes in this, uh, but uh, the general uh, principle has been now ever since the 1930s that uh, the general public is not allowed to invest in things that are not uh, properly documented. Another important uh, distinction in securities regulation is the distinction between insider and outsider. Uh, an insider is someone who is privy to the secret information of a company, uh, and um, uh, the uh, secret information uh, could be used to trade. Right? If you know the secrets of a company, if you know some uh, good news about the company before the, the public does, you could buy the shares in the company and, and experience the, the profit when the price goes up. You would be exploiting insider information, and you would be victimizing the outsiders. Uh, so the idea from the beginning at the SEC was that uh, insiders should not be allowed to trade on information that is uh, that is not uh, properly disclosed to the public. Um, and uh, but especially there was an important change, um, Regulation FD. Uh, came in in 2000. FD stands for full disclosure. This is a uh, SEC regulation. Uh, regulation FD uh, was, I think, passed in, reg in recognition of the internet. Under uh, uh, Louis Brandeis, Brandeis wanted companies to uh, always present the information, but for him, it always meant presenting a document. So they had something called a prospectus, for example. You could not sell a security without giving a prospectus to the potential buyers, and the prospectus would be something approved by the SEC. Uh, and I, I don't know if the word is approved, but it's uh, you have to uh, run it by the SEC, and then you always have to give that up. But he was living in the paper age. We now live in the internet age, uh, and so Regulation FD. I don't know if it actually mentions the internet, but it's imp it's uh, tends to the regulation FD basically says that whenever a company announces information, it has to be announced uh, available almost instantly to everybody in the market. And so the way it has worked out in practice is that companies, when they have a major announcement to make, they have some kind of web event, and anybody in the world. They would be notified, and they can get on and hear it uh, as it's happening. So we kind of have meetings, uh, big meetings <laughs> on the web for uh, disclosure of important information. Uh, and so uh, uh, this has made it very clear. Then there's a there has to be if you announce anything, you have to announce it all at once on a certain date, and you can't have favored people that you give the announcement to. Uh, so market surveillance uh, is a process that uh, stock exchanges and other organizations do uh, to make sure that inside information is not being uh, uh, is not being uh, mishandled. And so the, the uh, self-regulatory organizations, SROs. Uh, which are industry organizations that regulate the industry. Uh, th that's an American way of doing things. Rather than have the government 
uh, regulate. We have a, an industry organization that does it so that the government doesn't have to. Uh, the SROs have complex um, regulatory equipment, computers that can dis dis discover um, uh, in insider trading. And uh, the SROs uh, will catch you, or they may catch you, if, if you try. So I wanted to give you an example of SRO behavior. Uh, and this is uh, just one news story. Um, it was in 1995. Uh, a secretary at IBM Corporation um, was asked to Xerox some documents by her boss. And the documents described a proposed takeover of Lotus Corporation. Remember Lotus? I <laughs> that was the uh, corporation that produced the first spreadsheet program. It's now been replaced mostly by at Microsoft Excel, but at the time it was big. Okay, so this was big news. IBM is going to take over Lotus, or uh, try to take over Lotus. And uh, we now know what happened because of the, uh, the surveillance investigation. Uh, she told her husband that she had just Xeroxed this thing about, she'd read what she was Xeroxing, and she told her husband, who was a beeper salesman, about the news. Uh, he did nothing except tell two friends the story. He didn't buy the show. He just told two friends. My wife says <laughs> that IBM is going to take over Lotus. The friends immediately bought uh, Lotus shares, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, by that was ju June two. By June five, uh, twenty-five people had bought uh, had spent uh, half a million dollars to buy on this tip. They included a pizza chef, an electrical engineer, a bank executive, a dairy wholesaler, a school teacher, and four stockbrokers. <laughs> okay, stockbrokers get the word <laughs> faster. Uh, guess what happened? Those people are all uh, uh, in trouble because it's illegal to trade on insider information, it, and this, they tracked them all down. And uh, 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 so uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, and this is the example of uh, uh, Emulex Corporation. Maybe this isn't exactly in insider trading. This is more fraud. But uh, in uh, what year was this? Is around sometime in the late 90s. Uh, Mark Jacob, uh, uh, his name, <laughs> he's a guy, he's the criminal here. He's probably out of jail now. <laughs> Mark Jacob uh, was upset with, uh, he had been an employee of Emulex. Uh, and uh, uh, had, uh, had access to inside information of the company. Uh, and so he I guess he was involved in the, um, in the uh, dissemination of information for the company. So he kind of knew how they did press releases. So he sent out a fake press. He, he shorted the company, and he, uh, the stock in the company, and he, bought, uh, he, he put out a fake press release uh, saying that there was bad news for the company. Uh, and uh, he knew how to make it look like one of Emulex press releases. Um, he also did it from the El Camino Community College <laughs> Library, because he thought, I, I'll be careful. I won't issue this fake press release on my own computer, because they might be able to track me back to my own computer. So he went to this community college and got one of their library computers, and he issued the press release there. He got picked up by all the major news services. The stock plummeted. He sold immediately, and, and he made a lot of money. But the problem is, it didn't work. They, 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 they track back who sold, who had shorted and who had sold just before, just at that time. And they also, um, they went back to the El Camino Community College Library, <laughs> and they interviewed the librarians and tried to um, ask them, do you remember somebody coming here that didn't look like a student? And uh, they identified him, and so he was caught. So th that's what, uh, what surveillance does. Um, uh, they make markets work because if you didn't have this, there would be all kinds of, there would be all kinds of uh, uh, crooks and uh, uh, bad, uh, bad actors. Uh, and uh, the, the thing about these uh, organizations is that they cost money and they cost nuisances. A lot of people in the financial community are annoyed by them because these regulations are costly to comply with. And uh, 
they take uh, a lot of resources. But uh, I think an uh, enlightened view is that these things are absolutely essential uh, into trusts in the market. Um, another form of, uh, uh, of uh, regulation is accounting regulation. So, for example, we have uh, in the United States the Financial Accounting Standards Board. It's right here in Connecticut, or FASB. This is a, not a government organization. Uh, it was organized uh, uh, by the SEC in 1973, uh, but the SEC didn't want to do this job. They wanted it to be done privately. Uh, so what FASB does for the United States is it creates what are called uh, generally accepted, that's a G, generally accepted accounting practices. Uh, they're rules for how a company should keep its books so that, uh, 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 so that there's some regularity and standards in how uh, accounting is done. Uh, and so when, when uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board listens to what corporations are saying and, uh, and helps them uh, uh, it, it adjust these standards from time to time, but it, ha it does have a, a definitions that have to be maintained. Uh, and um, so a company has a, uh, a, a profit and loss statement, and uh, there is something that uh, is called net income, uh, which is a measure of how much the company is making, the, the, uh, the profits after expenses of the company, called the bottom line, uh, and uh, the uh, GAAP standards uh, define this. There's also operating income. Uh, now, companies can use other definitions of uh, other accounting standards besides these, uh, and some of these other Definitions which are not always GAAP, other standards, uh, and are widely used in the industry are uh, other kinds of, they have what's called core earnings, uh, pro forma earnings, uh, EBITDA, uh, which is earnings. <laughs> uh, uh, earnings before interest taxes, uh, depreciation and amortization, uh, adjusted earnings. There's all kinds of different definitions, and so uh, uh, companies like to do it their own way because they want to present themselves in the best way to the public. But uh, they're not allowed to just do it their own way; they have to do it according to uh, uh, standards. Uh, and so the gap accounting is standardized. So what a, what a company can do is present things in two different ways. Uh, uh, they, they can present it gap, and then that goes to Edgar, or th and they can also present it any other way they like. But the law, uh, the SEC requires that they at least present the standard earnings uh, definitions for, um, for all these things. Now, another um, let me just mention uh, off-balance sheet accounting. Uh, the uh, one thing that the SEC requires that companies file is their balance sheet, uh, which you can look up for any company on Edgar. Uh, the balance sheet uh, of a company has two columns. It has assets and it has liabilities. Uh, and so on one side is everything the company owns, and the other side is everything the company owes. Okay? Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the net worth of the company is their assets minus their liabilities, uh, and that represents uh, the, uh, the value that the company has if they paid off all their liabilities. Uh, the, what the SEC has to worry about is something called off balance sheet accounting, 
uh, which occurs when companies try to hide some of the uh, things that they, the, the liabilities they have, by not recording them on the balance sheet. Uh, and uh, if you can get away with that, then you can do, uh, you, you can conceal maybe some risky investments you've made or some uh, leverage that you've had. Uh, you might have lever- bought investments in something by borrowing money, and so the investment, the combined investment and liability could be very volatile. You don't want people to know that, <laughs> so you don't put it on the balance sheet. Uh, so uh, the SEC and other regulators have to watch for this. The classic example of a company that did this, uh, it's a classic now, was Enron Corporation. Um, and uh, they had a number of partnerships that they put on uh, as off balance sheet. So they were making risky uh, investments, but they weren't reporting it properly on, uh, on the uh, SEC forms. And so people didn't know how risky, uh, how risky Enron was. Uh, more recently, we uh, this is, came out last year. Uh, the SIVs are so-called structured investment vehicles. Uh, were used by banks to cover up investments they had, often in risky subprime loans. Well, they they created special entities called SIVs, uh, and uh, the SIVs would be uh, Borrowing money on the commercial paper market to buy subprime loans, uh, and uh, they were uh, in a very risky position because subprime loans were already recognized as being risky, and they borrowed to buy them. And so, if the value of the subprime loans g- went down just a little bit, the uh, the sieve uh, would be in trouble. Uh, and so, in the sieve contract, there was some language that implied that. If the sieve ever went bankrupt, the bank would come back and rescue them. And so the sieve really was a liability, but it wasn't visible to, to investors who were in investing in the bank. So this is another example of off balance sheet accounting that was frustrating um, the rules of the SEC. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the um, uh, Another, uh, another instance of regulation that uh, is important in the United States, but it's very poorly known. Uh, we have something called CIPIC. Uh, that's the Securities Investor Protection Corporation. Which was created in 1970, uh, and this is the securities analog of the FDIC in banking. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned. I, I assume you know about the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. I thought that was better known. Well, let me just mention it uh, by analogy. Uh, in 1934, after the failure, well, it was actually created by Congress in 1933, and uh, uh, went into business in '34. The FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, so I'll put it down as 1934, guaranteed for small depositors uh, the uh, savings deposits they have at a bank. And that was to protect depositors. Uh, in the case of bank failure. And it was a very important uh, innovation because at that time there were huge runs on banks. People were pulling money out of banks because they feared that if the bank failed, then they would lose their money. And so it created a huge crisis in 1933. So it's, but it's for small investors because currently the limit on the SEC uh, is $100,000, right? So. That's not a lot of money. Um, maybe you think of it as a lot of money, but it's not. Uh, if someone's saving for their retirement, you better have a lot more than that. $100,000 is only a few years' income, at, even for low-income people. 
But at least uh, we want to protect the small investors in the savings in banks. So actually, if you if you if you have more than a hundred thousand dollars in a bank account, you should probably pull it out and spread it around over several banks because each bank is separately insured. So there's effectively no limit if you're just a little bit smart uh, and you move your accounts around. Uh, so we had so we had deposit insurance uh, until uh, starting in the Great Depression, and that's been very important. Uh, and it's now in every country. Uh, 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 so we had a, a run on a bank in the UK. Uh, it, it was called Northern Rock uh, last year, um, and it, it turns out that there was a failure of the UK deposit insurance. I would say it's a failure because uh, UK deposit insurance insured Northern Rock only for the first three thousand uh, pounds, up f completely, and then for the next I forget how many thousand pounds you were ninety percent insured. Uh, so that was not good enough because people were worried about losing 10 percent of their deposits, and so there was a big bank run, and Northern Rock uh, would have failed if the Bank of England hadn't come by to rescue them. Uh, so I think these deposit insurance uh, are very important, but we don't we didn't have anything for corresponding accounts at brokerage services until 1970, uh, and uh, it. Uh, this was motivated by a, a spectacular failure of a brokerage, good body, uh, in uh, in company, um, in 1970. I hope you know what I mean. A brokerage service is a is a place where stockbrokers work, and a stockbroker is somebody that manages your buying and selling of shares. All right, and so if you want to buy stock, you can call a stockbroker. Uh, like Merrill Lynch is a big retail broker, and they're right down here on the green. Uh, you can go there and say, I want to buy stocks, and the broker will say, fine, we'll set up an account for you. Uh, you deposit money in our account. Now, he's not a bank, he's a broker. Uh, we'll set up a cash account and a securities account, put some money in, and then you think about it, and then you call me up and say, do you want to buy uh, some stocks? Uh, then I'll, I'll take money out of your cash account, and I'll put it in. These securities. That's a broker, okay? Good Body and Company was a broker. But it failed in 1970. It went bankrupt. Uh, and then it looked like the people who had money and shares in them would lose. Um, there's two things. You can have a cash account with them. You put money into the cash account and you haven't bought shares with it yet. It's just sitting in a, it's like in a bank. Um, you could lose that because Good Body and Company is going bankrupt, right? It doesn't have it anymore. And what about your shares? Well, Good Body and Company is supposed to have your shares, uh, right? But it, they, they, they generally hold them in what's called street name. And that means Good Body and Company owns the shares. And you just have a re contractual relationship with Good Body that, in principle, some of those shares are yours. Um, but the company that you're investing in ultimately doesn't have your money. It's, it's good body that they're dealing with. Although they have ways of, for proxy and uh, other, they have ways of finding out who's who. But uh, the problem is if your brokerage f fir firm fails, you could lose uh, a lot. You could lose your cash account and your uh, security account. So SIPIC uh, was set up in 1970, uh, and SIPIC uh, insures cash accounts up to $100,000. And uh, securities accounts up to 500,000. And so uh, that's another example of government uh, involvement. Now, uh, uh, in uh, CIPIC was set up by an act of Congress. Uh, and uh, so uh, the um, unfortunately, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of CIPIC. Most people don't even know it exists. Uh, CIPIC did a survey of the U.S. population. Uh, and uh, this is one of the in 2001. This is one of the questions SIPIC asked. Um, the, the respondents were asked to identify the organization that insures you against losing money in the stock market, or as the result of investment fraud. Uh, only 16 percent of investors knew that there is no such company. And make it clear, SIPIC does not. If you if you invest in uh, some stock and it does badly, you can't go to SIPIC. And say, hey, I, my stock went down. Like, please give me my money back. 
uh, uh, they won't do it. Uh, and moreover, if you say, this stockbroker, he was lying to me. He told me that this was a good investment, and he even lied and said something to get me roped in. They won't pay you back. The only thing that CIPIC does is replace securities. In other words, if you had an account at a brokerage and you thought you had 100 shares of IBM, and now the broker is going bankrupt and the broker won't answer your email anymore and it's just gone, you go to CIPIC and say, I, I've, you know, I had these 100 shares. CIPIC then returns 100 shares to you. They don't pay you cash, they, they give you the 100 shares, and that's all they do. Uh, so you might say that our regulation hasn't gone far enough, and I think maybe it hasn't gone far enough. Uh, we protect certain kinds of things, and people have to pay attention. It's a difficult problem that uh, not everyone is smart. They vary in their abilities. So we try to make a world in which uh, it's pretty safe for the small investor who's not paying attention. But you know, it's never perfect, and, and, and we can't figure out yet a way to make it perfect. And we still have small investors who are defrauded, who are treated badly. And the subprime crisis is an example. Some people were treated badly in this uh, recent financial crisis. So we just have to keep improving our regulation and trying to make it uh, deal with all of the problems as they come up. The problems are complex because we're trying to make a system in which people are able to make their own decisions as much as possible and to make them in a way that, uh, in an environment that they trust. But it's just too complicated and too, it's impossible to make it work perfectly. All right, so that will conclude this lecture. So I'll s I won't be here Monday, but I'll, uh, my TAs will, uh, will handle the exam, and I'll, I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>